Watch this full series at the links in the description below and subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch new mental health videos every week. Recovery from addiction is tough, but it can be even tougher around the holiday season. Here to provide some tips and insight is Andrea Arlington. Andrea, thanks for being back on Med Circle with us. Now, in case it's our viewers' first time meeting you, who are you and what is your role in family recovery? I'm the mother of two girls who are in recovery from heroin addiction mm -hmm. and long-term recovery, thankfully. Um, I also lost my brother to IV drug use and have been involved with marriages where there was substance use going on in both partners. Mm -hmm. And so I've been on that side of the fence, but I also, um, as a result of my son-in-law who married my daughter Alexis, coming to me at one point and saying in a very loving, compassionate way, you are the common denominator here, Andrea, and you need help. And at that point, the truth was so, like I was so solid. That message came across as, as real and caring and compassionate and truthful. Mm -hmm. And it rang something inside of me that was like, oh my God, he's right. Yeah. I could hear it because it came from such a non-judgmental place. Yeah. And I got the help I needed. I went and worked with a therapist who specialized in family system work and recovery. I then got certified in family recovery as a life coach. Um, I'm now getting facilitated in Brene Brown's Daring Way work on shame and vulnerability so I can use that material to help my clients. And I started a company called Families United for Recovery, which helps families to be able to walk away from detachment and control and really embrace the what works, which is which is connection through a compassionate response and mm -hmm. well-researched tools and strategies that help your loved one move toward recovery. Yes, and we filmed a series on more of your life. I mean, it's really your life is very interesting and unique. All of our lives are unique, but uh, I mean, you were, you had a reality show, uh, you had a very, uh, your life was displayed out in, in the public. So it's a fascinating story, but even though it was so unique, still very relatable. So I encourage people, if you like the content in this video, go to medcircle.com, check out the series with Andrew Arlington, mm -hmm. you'll get even more. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about tips and strategies that uh, people can do around the holiday season to you know, stay in their sobriety. And I first wanna start with the people who are in recovery. I'm assuming they're in recovery, whether it's short term or long term, doesn't matter. But the holiday seasons can be a difficult time to stay right. sober. So what are some right. tips that you have for them? Well, the biggest thing is to reduce your stress load as much as possible. And if going home to your family is stressful, don't do it. Don't do it. No. Yeah. I mean, your number one priority is sustaining your recovery for a minimum I mean, like you have to really work hard at it mm -hmm. for like two to five years. Mm -hmm. And once you're at like five year mark, you're pretty good, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But until that mark, don't do anything. Doesn't matter how bad your, your family wants to look good mm -hmm. to all the other relatives and have you come home and be in recovery. Cause that's the mom I was mm -hmm. when my daughters were, you know, first in recovery. It was like, I just wanted to prove to the whole family and everybody else that we were good. And I felt like this one holiday dinner was gonna do it, you know? But don't do it, don't go home um, if it stresses you out. And instead, go hang out with your friends that are in recovery mm -hmm. and create a family with them mm -hmm. and have an incredible holiday celebrating what you should be very proud of, and that's your recovery. Yes, I love that. Now, what about for the children, and these can be adult children, who are coming home uh, for the holidays, and the parents suspect that they might have slipped in their recovery and, and relapse. Maybe they're showing signs of being under the influence during the holiday time. How do you approach that person? Because I will tell you what I would have done mm -hmm. before I met you. I would have said, you are telling me that you're sober and then you show up in my house drunk in front of everybody, mm -hmm. no, get out, don't talk to me. Don't embarrass me. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> that is, I, I, I believe that's what I would have done uh, before I met you. Oh, believe me, that's what I would have done before I met me too. <laughs> <laughs> this ver the real you, this version. <laughs> the version, yeah. right? Um, so if your loved one comes home and you can tell that they're under the influence, 
you've got to co respond with a compassionate response because um, look, the idea of facing your family when you're newly in recovery and have not really been like, you're not solidly in your recovery yet for a, a long time once you first enter treatment or, or start recovery. So it is so stressful. Like you're gonna see people who you know are judging you. And like you're walking around like you're on eggshells just to prove, you know you're anticipating this, right? That you have to prove to everybody that you you're good. You've got your shit together now. There's no more um, craziness going on in your life, right? So you have to, like, you have to prove to yourself, and that's a really uncomfortable feeling. That's mm -hmm. really like you don't feel connected to these people who are judging you, right? That you don't feel good. So. Um, if your loved one comes home and they're under the influence, have some compassion. Like, first of all, don't jump down their throat and say, I can't believe you. You're at it again. Oh my God. And aunt so-and-so is here. What is she going to think? That's just not it. If, if there's any chance that you think your loved one's going to come home under the influence, let them come home under the influence and don't have anybody else over. So you have an opportunity to connect with them mm. and make them feel like they belong in your life, no matter if they're using or not. Make them feel a sense of well-being, being with you, that you're not judging them or shaming them. If you think there's a chance that that's going to happen, and believe me, we all think there's a chance that's going to happen when they're in newly recovery. And my suggestion is, and what I wish I would have done during the, hol the first Christmas, was not have had people over. Because what's more important than my daughter feeling like she doesn't have to prove herself to anybody because that's a shame trigger right there. Yeah. And shame is one of the greatest triggers for uh, relapse and stress. So rather than having anybody over, unless they're like on board with this whole philosophy of compassionate response and supporting your loved one with, with evidence-based tools and they know what they're doing, don't have them over because mm. nothing's more important than your than the life of your loved one mm -hmm. and anything that could send them into relapse, don't do it. Mm. But if they do show up and there are people there, your response is going to be calm, cool, and collected because you're going to have worked out in your mind way in advance, how do I keep my stress level down and how do I avoid being triggered myself? You've mm -hmm. got to have a plan, mm -hmm. okay? And we can talk about that. But first of all, if your loved one comes home and they're under the influence, you're just going to look at them and you're going to say, could I talk to you for a second in the other room? And you're going to say to them, gosh, it must have been so hard for you to make this decision to come, come here today. I mean, look, we've got this whole family and everybody expects you to be in recovery and sober. Like that's a trigger right there. I can imagine, honey, I'm so sorry that I chose to have a family dinner when you're so early in recovery. Like take some freaking responsibility for, for their state of mind. I'm so sorry, I should have thought of this. But you know what, since everybody is here and you're you know, a, a little under the influence right now, why don't you just take a couple of deep breaths and make a decision? Do you really want to stay? If you don't, I'll send you home in an Uber and you and I can have dinner tomorrow night or this week. Or how about if you go hang out in your room for a couple of hours and come down when you're feeling a little less high and, and then hang out with us, you mm -hmm. know? Like be that like solution focused in a compassionate way don't degrade them, don't shame them, don't ostracize them, and don't go downstairs and tell the entire family, oh my God, I can't believe they did that. Because that's who I was, mm -hmm. you know? I was all about looking like I was the greatest mom on the face of this planet, and how could she do that? That was just so completely distorted mm -hmm. in, on my part. But you, you can't do that. If, if your loved one is still struggling or if they show up and they've relapsed because they're triggered by this whole stressful holiday thing, don't blame them. You know? Okay, so you have this compassionate conversation, but let's say the child, uh, and I just say child, they're adults, right. but the, the, the person says, mom, stop, I'm not high, you're delusional. I smoked a little bit in the car just to take the edge off, but that's it, I'm totally fine. I wanna go to dinner, you're the one making this a deal. Everyone else was cool, everyone else was fine. You are freaking out about this, leave me alone. Right, and that's, 
a potential outcome or mm -hmm. you know issue. So you have to decide right then and there. Okay, and we never said boundaries to control somebody else's behavior. We said boundaries to control our level of comfort. Mm -hmm. And if this is your house, and there's and and, sh and they're under like severely high, right? Mm -hmm. You might just gracefully ask everybody to go have dinner at the local restaurant mm -hmm. on you because mm -hmm. there's an issue happening here. Mm -hmm. Or you might say to your loved one, you know, I'm really uncomfortable with this, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. If it's if you're OK with it, I'm just going to surrender because you have every right to do it your way. And who am I to stand here and say, you have to be sober so I look good? Right? Because that's really a, a, a large part of it. Hello. It's Hello. huge. Hello. I was that mom. Mm -hmm. You better get your shit together and get sober. Not because I want you to be sober and get your shit together, but because I don't want to look bad to my dad, to my aunts and uncles, to my brother, to his wife, to the whole family, right? The entire universe, by the way, because my daughter was on the front page of the mm -hmm. LA Times mm -hmm. <laughs> and a lot of other news media. Um, so, I mean, everybody knew that our family was one of the most dysfunctional families on the planet at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but by the way, there are 40 mil million people who suffer from substance use disorder in our country, so we're not alone. No. Okay. No, you just happen to have cameras on you while That's it all happened. Right. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people who are going to hear that roll their eyes and go, no, you got to put the hammer down. You got to tell you got to shake these this kid under control and you got to explain that there are clear lines. Yeah, because you know what? We actually get a, a dopamine rush from controlling other people's behavior and from being self-righteous. And, oh boy, there, there's just nothing like being right and making somebody else wrong. Cause you really do get an, a, like an adrenaline rush and a dopamine uh -huh. rush out yeah. of that. And I'm just saying like, don't deny it guys. It's true. Yeah. I was that mom. I was that wife. Oh man. It, it, when I was right, I felt so good. Oh yeah. 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 So what was your question? <laughs> well, I, it, you're, you're answering it. It's the response to the people who say, look, I, that sounds nice, but that's too fluffy. We're right. dealing with opioid addiction right. so, or whatever addiction. So if someone walks into my house for Christmas and they're high out of their mind, you're out. Don't call me. You're cut off. I'm taking everything away. You're, you don't step into this house again. Do not call me until you're okay, sober. Okay, so here's my response. If your kid was dying of cancer or does any other life-threatening condition, would that be your response when they mm. came home and their, their um, condition was crippling them in that moment? Is that your response? No, it's not your response. You would be compassionate mm. and concerned mm. and supportive and mm -hmm. loving and kind. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a life and death threatening condition with our loved ones today. Oh, yeah. There's no way that that should be your response. As soon as they walk out that door, they could be dead. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. I'm that's sorry, truth. I know that's painful to hear, but that's what we're seeing. We're losing 200 people a day in our country to overdose. And so when we do that, we lose every p possibility of having the ability to influence them with a loving, kind, connected, relationship. Yeah. If you have that with them, then you have the ability to to listen to what they're needing. They'll feel safer with you. Um, they'll, they'll feel more likely to want to reach out to you when they're ready. Yeah. Like if you d ostracize them and polarize them, you have no chance of uh, like them calling you. They'd rather yeah. stick another needle in their arm yeah. than reach out to somebody they know that's going to ostracize and shame them. Yeah. And here's the other part. It's very likely that many parents watching this have tried the shaming, the guilt, the blame, mm -hmm. because it's an it's it's a it's a almost a normal reaction, right? Based on us, based on what we know, what we see, what we feel, to blame and and go out that and and, and attack it that way. So if that's what you've tried and you mm -hmm. haven't gotten the results that you want. Wouldn't you at least try this way? 
why don't you at least try the way Andrea's saying to try it? And it doesn't mean try it once, have one mm -hmm. calm response and then yeah, they right. blow up at you and go, well, I tried, done. It's a new way of addressing this. Exactly. Like if you were trying to get sober, if your loved one's trying to get sober and they tried one time not to use and they, they, they might have not made it, mm -hmm. if they gave up, they'd use again, right? And they might end up, you know, going on a binge for 10 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. Same with us. We expect them to work a program and get it right the first time they try. We've got to, we can't expect them to do stuff that we ourselves are not willing to do. It's so good. It's so it's true. So it's so true. That's why it's so good. Yeah. 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 Um, what do you want the parents to really understand about their child's addiction? that their substance use disorder is a symptom, not the issue. It's a symptom of all the underlying issues of feeling not good enough, mm. of feeling, um, you know, like this, this strategy I'm using, my substance gives me a sense of well-being that I don't get in the life without it. Mm -hmm. And what I need more than anything, you know, from the kid uh, perspective is to find ways, new strategies that allow me to feel a sense of well-being and belonging um, without the use of this substance. But I need a team of people who love and care about me and make me feel like I belong. And I have a sense of well-being with, uh, when I'm with them to help me navigate this because mm -hmm. I've never navigated anything that has this much control over me, mm -hmm. right? And so we, uh, that's what we need the parents to understand is that this is not bad behavior and stupid choices. It might have been experimenting initially with drugs and substances, but what happens is, is that it feels so good the mm -hmm. first couple of times you do it. And then before you know it, it's not a feel good thing. It's like, I can't, I can't go through these withdrawal pains anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I'm so hooked because it puts me in a trance that doesn't make me feel like I feel when I'm not on it. Mm -hmm. You know, and pretty soon they're they're in a complete state of, of uh, being taken over by mm -hmm. this substance. And it's a life threatening condition and you should not take it as if it's bad behavior and stupid choices or rebelliousness or moral issues. It's none of that. It's yeah. it's a strategy to feel happy and yeah. whole and satisfy the emptiness that or the shame or whatever it is that we're feeling inside. Just like we as parents, like our our thing to feel good and feel happy and feel a sense of well being is to fix our kids. That's right. So like we're as addicted to trying to fix them and control them as they are to their substance. But, but when we stop trying to fix and control them and instead try to sit side by side with them on a bench overlooking the playing field, looking to see what is the strategy that we need to win this game, yeah. to win this, this um, the healing of yeah. our family yeah. and of this issue of not feeling good inside. Like, how do I help us both feel yeah. better? Yeah. It's not about polarizing and they're over here right. and you're over here right. and they're the bad guys. Right. That's not what it's about. Yeah. It's about coming together as a family and learning to live with loving harmony and compassion and find the happiness together. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here and sharing <laughs> this. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you have chosen this line of work. I want everyone to hear this. Thank you. I want everyone to understand that what you're providing is an option for them to consider and right. look at. It's your strategies. And yes. so thank mm -hmm. you for sharing your strategies with you're us. You're welcome. Awesome. Can I share how people can reach me? Oh yeah, okay. I was gonna do it, but you, you oh, get it. Thank you. Listen up. <laughs> okay, so you can call me at 424-203-4569. That's 424-203-4569, or you can go on my website, Families United for Recovery. And also you can find me on Instagram under Andrea Arlington. Thank you, Andrea, again. Excellent. Make sure you reach out to her if you would like. I'm Kyle Kittleson. Remember, whatever you're going through, you got this. Thanks for watching. If you liked what you just saw, then why not subscribe? Click right here for new episodes and new series every week. And to access exclusive mental health videos that we only release at medcircle.com, check out the links below.